very fascinating talk. We know that decentralization is very important, but the question is how do you build a res resilient uh, portfolio to back your decentralized stablecoins? So you might need to turn to some fine German engineering to that end. We are very pleased to give a warm guten Morgen to Stefan. Three minutes, all right, three minutes. Uh, we'll wish a warm guten Morgen to, uh, not to tease it too much, the guest will be Stefan um, Schulden Zucker. Stefan Schuldenzucker uh, from Gyroscope. Um, so in the meantime, um, does anyone know any good stablecoin jokes? I don't think that there's yet been a stablecoin joke. No? All right. What have people been doing so far in France? Uh, earlier, there were a few bleary-eyed people who uh, came in and they'd seen the uh, fireworks last night at the Eiffel Tower. Was there anyone who trickled in a little bit later and was uh, watching the fireworks last night? Yeah? So. Some of you showing up just a little bit later for that. So, um, how much fun was that to actually like just be in Paris um, at the same time that there's all this surge of energy coming into the crypto ecosystem for the first time in like a year, and just see fireworks shooting off everywhere, and everyone from Web3 was uh, really, really a great, uh, great moment. Um, so, uh, we hope that you are, of course, going to be sticking around for all the events throughout today and tomorrow. Um, so, if you missed uh, Julian's introduction earlier. This is, in fact, the first stablecoin summit um, which has ever been convened, um, to our knowledge. So maybe there's been like some small events that took places in cafes or coffee shops, um, but this is the first one of this magnitude and this size, and it's such an important, important subject. Um, in my estimation, if you look at the front page of CoinGecko, you'll constantly see within the top ten number a number of stablecoins. And I don't think it's any mistake that we all here recognize that stablecoins are the killer use case for cryptocurrency. Like, it's not even a question. Like, we've had NFTs, which are kind of fun. Uh, Crypto Kitties clogged the Ethereum network a long time ago. They're still seeing NFT mints clogging it nowadays. But it, if anyone's tried to do a transaction using a bank, uh, you're doing a wire transfer, especially more than a few thousand dollars, you know that the ability to effortlessly send currencies across the globe 24 7 is just by far the killer use case. Um, so, this extends to de the developing world where you know, if you're in a country that's ransacked by hyperinflation, um, it's a real problem that you have to face on a daily basis. How do you keep your value? Uh, stable coins have become a lifeline to so much of the developing world that way. And then for anyone who's in the more like a, of a world superpower, you, know, you might just like stable coins because it's a nice refuge when you're trying to flip stable coins 24 seven between the newest you know, meme tokens or your favorite cryptocurrencies back to stable coins to try and hold value. So it's, um, you know, I don't think I need to explain the import of stablecoins to everyone here in the audience. We all get it. Um, then the question just comes, like, how do we actually design it? Uh, there's been so many uh, aspects of design. We've seen already most of our speakers talk a bit about the stablecoin trilemma. Uh, so anyway, without further ado, uh, we're going to discuss more designing a resilient portfolio with the aforementioned Stefan of Gyroscope Labs. Stefan, please. Thanks a lot. I use this? Oh, wow. Uh, so, uh, great to meet you, everyone. Um, I'm Steffen, I'm from Gyroscope, uh, and today I'm going to talk about uh, designing a resilient reserve portfolio for decentralized stablecoins. And let me give you a little bit of context about Gyroscope. Um, the idea of Gyroscope is that we were trying to improve upon many problems we saw with some stablecoins. Um, I mean, you, you, you know, like, like some of them. Uh, so. Uh, risks are concentrated, governance is slow, um, scaling issues, and so on. And um, so today, what I want to focus on, on is uh, the concentration of uh, risks, and this is why we think we need diversified portfolios. Um, tracking. So often in stable coins that are collateral backed, um, one fake collateral uh, has a risk of dragging down the whole stable coin. And of course, here, does this have a laser? No. So, so um, here in, in March of this year, this is of course what we saw, um, that USDC went down, and by implication, many other stable coins also went down, with the exception of USDT. Um, so what you might be saying right now is, well, what this means is that building a diversified portfolio of mostly stable assets is actually very hard because we see the correlation right there, right? Um, 
So one thing that's going to make this a bit easier for me is that what we care about is long-term sustain sustainability more than short-term correlation. Um, and the other thing that I want to highlight is that, um, so this thing is obviously there, but it's also incredibly rare. So if we look at price data and correlations and all these kinds of things, that's something we can do, but we also need to look at fundamentals because stablecoin crashes are, of course, these very rare kind of black swan events, which means that you don't have a lot of data. Um, so gyroscope, the idea of gyroscope is to build a set of new financial infrastructure advancements that will unlock a new third path between um, centralized and algorithmic stable coins. And so the, the conclusion of this will be a new stable coin that we call GYD. By the way, launch is planned for August, maybe Q3. Um, we have a proto system right now that's on Polygon, that's under this address. It's working pretty well. Um, this is mostly for testing. So, so Gyroscope has these three pillars, and I'm going to focus on one of them. Um, the first one is resilient defense of the stablecoin itself. The second one is liquidity network to keep the token liquid. And the third one is all kinds of redundancies built into the system. Um, and today I want to talk about the reserve design, obviously, um, and yield source design. So the, the aim of Gyroscope is to be 100% collateralized um, and backed by a diversified portfolio of crypto assets. Um, that are deployed in low-risk yield-generating strategy in a risk-segmented way. So you have actual useful diversification there. Um, and the main stabilization mechanism is mint and redeem arbitrage. Uh, let me get a little bit more in detail. So when uh, someone wants to mint or redeem GYD, they go through a mechanism we call the dynamic stability mechanism. And what this is going to do is that um, they need to provide, let's say they want to mint, they need to provide a balanced portfolio of assets uh, according to certain weights. Now they can deviate from these weights in some limited way. If only small amounts are minted, you can also just mint against one asset up to some tolerance, etc. cetera. Um, but by and large, we want to keep this uh, balance of reserve assets. Um, and then what's going to happen is that the reserve assets are priced using a system we call the co uh, consolidated price feed. Um, and they, they uh, receive GYD in exchange for the value of these assets. Now, what does this reserve portfolio look like? Um, we have these um, buckets we call vaults, like everyone does. Um, every vault holds um, one or more assets in them. Um, and then there's a strategy that uh, tells us how these assets are invested. Um, usually, if you see more than one asset in a vault, that means that there's a liquidity provision strategy. Um, so what, what are these assets um, at launch? These are mostly going to be other stable coins. So Gyroscope will start out as a kind of meta stable coin with a diversified portfolio of other stable coins backing it. Um, this is going to be the main topic of my talk. Um, and then going forward, uh, we can start including other assets in some risk limited way. Um, right, so what I want to talk about now is give you a risk based overview of uh, the task of choosing um, these different stable coins that should back the system. Um, then I'm going to talk about custodial stable coins, uh, non-custodial stable coins, and finally talk a little bit about strategies. Um, yeah, by the way, so sources for this are, of course, our ongoing work at Gyroscope. Um, and another source is the PhD thesis of my co-founder, Raya Klagesmund, who actually did a lot of research, uh, which you can see here, on the dynamics of stable coins and stability and comparisons, etc. Um, the basic principle of reserve selection is, um, like, this is, this is the point I want to stress. Um, let's consider stable coins as risky assets that usually do not manifest these risks in price. Um, and then we want to build some risk segmentation to, to get a, a robust and, and liquid portfolio. Um, this one I already said. Let's look at the fundamentals here more than uh, time series. If we look at stable coins, we can group them in two, like the, the largest buckets you can think of. The first one is custodial stable coins, like uh, Tether, let's say. Um, you, there's an entity that uh, holds certain assets. Um, th that's an off-chain process. You have a token on-chain. 
and you need to trust that entity to well manage these assets well and do the right thing. And the risks here are oh sorry. And the risks here are um, reasonably well understood. Um, in traditional finance, so you have like, like counterparty credit risks, um, you have censorship, of course, um, and then you have other traditional finance risks. And then there's, of course, this non-custodial world where um, you don't have to trust the protocol, the important processes are on-chain. Um, and, and then you have like new risks like uh, deleveraging, um, you, you have uh, oracle risks, uh, governance risks, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and of course, these systems t also tend to be more complex, so the risk of smart contract bugs is higher. So let me talk a little bit about custodial stablecoins. And um, so be before, I, before I go through the slide, I want to say that custodial, the risk profile of custodial stablecoins is typically a little bit different than for, uh, let's say, very non-custodial, very crypto-backed systems. Um, so what we would expect for a custodial stablecoin is not that the whole value just disappears. So something like a UST, you wouldn't really expect for Tether, but you would maybe expect that there are some haircuts, that there is some, some, uh, some, some kind of discount. There could be freezing of assets, but that also doesn't mean that these assets are gone forever. Um, so, so kind of what we want to do is make sure that not too many of these assets go too far down or are too much frozen for too long a time. Um, <clears throat> and, and so with that in mind, we can think about these, these different um, risk categories. Most of these resemble a money market fund. Um, and then we can think about that. So of course, there's like asset backing risks. Um, there are risks that, that, that are maybe not just about the price of these assets, but there's also something like duration risks if they hold like, um, like fixed period bonds, for example. Um, there's uh, counterparty risk, obviously, uh, censorship, um, the upgradability of smart contracts. Of course, there's a risk that the custodian will just decide to make the system into something else on their own volition. Um, there are these regulatory aspects, and, and I mean, typically, of course, usually we, we think about this, right? What if a government intervenes and, and the thing gets banned and they are forced to censor us or something? Um, but of course, there's also a positive thing about regulation, which is uh, accountability. A regulated entity is typically maybe more trustworthy. I, I guess it depends on the entity, but other things equal, that's the case. Um, and then there are liquidity aspects. So um, custodial service coins are typically uh, reasonably liquid off-chain. Um, and, and of course, we also need to think about on-chain liquidity of these assets. Uh, what did I want to add? Oh, yeah, right. So when, when we are choosing here, because we want to build a portfolio, we're not so interested in a ranking in the sense of what's the best one, but we are more interested in risk structure um, so that we can, um, we can choose the risks we are exposing ourselves to. Um, for for non-custodial ones, obviously, the story is a bit more complicated, and I want to, again, like distinguish two uh, broad categories. Um, the first one are leveraged-based or collateralized debt position systems. This would be something like the, the DAI loan vaults or the, the original multi-collateral DAI system where someone wants to take leverage against their position. They um, lock their asset up and they get a loan that's over-collateralized. And the other one would be swap-based systems. Uh, I mean, Robert also outlined in this, in this talk before um, where an arbitrageur sees that, let's say, the price of the stablecoin is a li little bit higher than one, and so they mint new assets um, uh, at the at the mint and redeem mechanism uh, to get arbitrage, and, and but the assets themselves are then protocol controlled value. Um, now, if we want to make this much more complicated, we can use uh, something that um, my co-founder Raya did in his research, and uh, put everything into this three-dimensional matrix. I want to briefly talk about the dimensions. I'm not going to talk about everything here. The first question we should ask about non-custodial stablecoins is. Um, What's the asset backing, obviously? And um, th th there are kind of, kind of two realms here, right? The first one is uh, asset backing could be exogenous, something that's not related to the system itself. And the other one is um, asset backing could be endogenous, or something, something like uh, Luna, um, where a, a system is backed by its own governance token. Um, then we should think about who absorbs risks. Um, are there agents that need to absorb risk, like in, in collateralized debt position systems, like these ones? 
um, or are there protocol assets that uh, absorb risk? And, and gyroscope uh, is a system that, that goes here, so we are exogenously backed uh, with a mint and redeem mechanism, so the protocol would uh, absorb risks. And then there's this third dimension, which is who decides about issuance. And, and again, Robert talked about this uh, in the talk before. If the agent, if there's a self-interested agent with some, um, let's say, leverage interest, who decides about issuance, um, then you need a somewhat, somewhat more uh, involved system uh, to make sure that the supply of the stable coin is at the right point. Um, now, I should talk about two more. The first one is DAI, of course, which um, uh, sits in, in both of these uh, regions. Started out here, and now it's mostly here. Um, and the other one is uh, Curve USD, which uh, currently primarily sits in this region with this um, interesting new uh, mechanism uh, uh, called LAMA. Um, essentially, these are collateralized debt positions, but the, the liquidation, of course, is handled in a very smooth way, in a very uh, innovative way, so that you don't have separate liquidation events, um, but liquidation kind of happens smoothly over time, which, uh, w which I, I think is quite nice because it limits losses of people from these liquidations. Um, and then down here um, are these systems called peg keepers, um, where, of course, the idea is if um, in certain markets and certain AMMs the price of Curve USD um, is too high, then the peg keeper would mint new Curve USD and deposit them one sided into that pool. Of course, the implication of this when you do this is that then the peg keeper holds a portfolio that consists of Curve USD and whatever the other asset in that pool is, and that means that um, effectively that's an asset backing by a stable coin. Um, again, in this, in this very nice, smooth way that I think is very efficient, um, when you know what the primary market for this, for this coin will be, the, the main trading venue. Now, right, I should show this. Uh, we have kind of this like diagonal of death here. Um, <laughs> so so that's, th that's not the only reason why we thought that, that so exogenous Maybe this is obvious, but exogenous asset backing seems to be a pretty good idea, and endogenous asset backing seems to be um, very tricky to get right. Um, right. I want to talk a little bit more about the the risks in these systems. So the basically the same the the, the kind of cousin of the slide I did before. Um, so we we focus on exogenous collateral only because we think uh, that makes sense. And once you do that. Um, of course, again, you need to think about uh, asset backing risks. Um, there, there is, of course, composition going on, right? So um, if, um, let's say, DAI holds a lot of USDC and I hold a lot of DAI, then I'm implicitly holding a lot of USDC, but I'm also holding other things. So I'm exposed to a certain portfolio, and you, in your minds you can uh, come up with this like graph of exposures where at every node, uh, risk is remixed and transformed and new risks are added and new stability mechanisms are added. Um, th there seems to be there seems to be a trade-off uh, between having stability and having some custodial collateral. Um, we saw that DAI before they introduced the DSM um, had uh, certain stability problems. For example, the, the price of ETH dropped, the price of DAI spiked. Um, and it seems that you need some custodial collateral to um, make the price at least short term stable. Um, otherwise, you, you get like these delevering spirals, uh, negative rates, etc. Um, then there's the question how does the system handle under collateralization events? And again, this refers to both um, kind of the, the leverage side, um, so collateralized debt positions and, and swap, swap based mechanisms. So, how does a reserve backed system handle uh, under collateralization of its reserve portfolio, and how does a collateralized debt position-based uh, system handle liquidations? Um, then there's there's governance, of course. Unfortunately, there's not a custodian who can just decide to upgrade the protocol, but of course, there's a governance process. Um, and, and regulatory risk, um, maybe, depending on the involvement of other entities. Um, we, we have this uh, oracle risk, which is, of course, unique to DeFi, that you rely on some other price oracle to prevent prices. Um, what I want to say here is that um, 
again, I, I don't want to say that all of these risks should be avoided because when you're building a system, it's impossible to avoid all of the risks. But instead, uh, we want to build a di diversification across all of these risks. Um, and then smart contract risk and liquidity. Um, strategies. So um, the main, the, right, I should repeat the goal. So the, the goal is to generate good risk-adjusted yield. So if risk is low and the real yield is also relatively low, that's actually fine. Um, the, the main strategy that um, we're going to use at launch are liquidity provision strategies. Uh, we have these custom um, uh, liquidity pools that we call elliptic concentrated liquidity pools on Balancer. They integrate with Balancer and the, the idea is that um, these are special liquidity pools that allow to shape the liquidity in a way that fits the asset pair uh, to a relatively high degree. Um, what, what we should keep in mind is that <laughs> when we ha provide liquidity between those between two assets, that's not diversification, right? That's unioning up the risks of all of these assets because if one of them goes down, you end up with a cheaper one. Um, so we, um, these, these liquidity pools union risks between asset pairs and then, but you can have multiple of them and between these risks are gonna be segmented. Um, the idea then is that we would provide liquidity between assets that are correlated anyways. So assets that are exposed to similar risks already. Um, and if we do this, we are not introducing new risks in the mix. Um, I, I should maybe, I'm, I'm not sure if I should, should talk about this feature, but um, one kind of nice side effect of doing all of this is that um, the assets are held, so balances designed such that the assets are held by the vault um, so this reduces censorship risks a little bit because we only need to be concerned of the risk that Balancer would be censored by some component and not uh, us or, or um, yeah, not, not, not ourselves. Um, then we have some other strategies. Um, you, can, you can put uh, things into lending protocols. Of course, here you need to think about collateral um, backing. Um, we could put things into the DIDSR. Essentially, um, this is a way of getting as access to real-world assets because Maker holds them, you get all of the risks, and also um, a significant part of the yield when you do this. Um, and, and then we have some, some other ideas for the future. So now, let me give you an example. And I, I want to stress, this is just an example, right? This is not what we're going to do, but this is an example I used to illustrate um, all the things I talked about. And here, here is something one could do. Um, you have DAI in the DSR, you have USDC in Flux, you have uh, a liquidity pool between USDP and GUSD, LUSD in the stability pool, um, and then I tried to be provocative, so I uh, put uh, TUSD with USDT in there. Of course, in the, of course, in the future, um, you may not want to do this anymore. Um, or, or maybe you do, I mean, we, we need to see what happens. Um, so why do I claim that this embodies the things I talked about, this risk diversification? Um, well, if we look at DAI, um, we have decentralized backing here, um, over collateralized. We have real-world asset exposure, um, and we also have some exposure to custodial stablecoins through the PSM. Uh, if we look at Flux, of course, this is custodial again, so there's a risk overlap there, but it's uh, limited. Um, we get some custodial risks uh, again, um, and again, we, we can get some exposure to real-world assets. Um, this ECLP has two, I forgot what this is called, the New York uh, regulator, uh, regulated stable coins, um, which um, arguably should reduce the risk and they should also be similar risks. So if they suddenly, uh, let's say the US suddenly uh, decides to go rogue on, on all of DeFi, um, then both of these assets would have a problem, but we don't have one of them in a pool that would then create a problem for the other asset. Um, LUSD in the stabi stability pool is of course a very diff different story, fully decentralized. Um, you get some of the price volatility of ETH, you get the risk of deleveraging spirals, which these don't have. Um, and, and then we can uh, put, so here I wanted to put some custodial stable coins that are not based in the US, which are then of course exposed to different regulatory questions, different regulatory regimes, both in the positive and in the negative of course. So you, you might argue that 
uh, these are less well less transparently regulated perhaps um, at, at least from what we see and um, but at the same time of course you also don't have the the geographic risk of the US but you you have other geographic risks um, exactly I want to add two more things um, the first one is that once we have built this um, we can in the future extend it and uh, so this is what you've already seen um, and we can uh, then extend this with a second mechanism. I mean, no one says that gyroscope forever has to be purely this asset-backed mint and redeem scheme. Um, but instead, uh, we can also have uh, over-collateralized lending. And what we are thinking about here is to have an ECLP that uh, trades, that provides liquidity between, let's say, ETH and a liquid staking token or between two different li liquid staking tokens. And then, of course, here you're exposed to ETH as a risk. So you need to over-collateralize these. You cannot put them raw into the reserve. Um, but we can do this, and we can do over-collateralized lending here, and then we have a, a, separa a separate branch how GYD can be created. Um, I want to give like a quick, uh, well, li like a quick peek of what we're building right now. So right now we are working on this like big sheet of all of the different asset risks and all of the different stable coins. And um, so again, the goal here is this is a bit different from, from previous as efforts that um, uh, Stakehouse did, for example. The, the goal is less to kind of rank the stable coins to figure out which one is the best, but to give you an overview of the risk structure and the connections between the different stable coins. Um, right, and so basically you see everything in here that we talked about. So to, to conclude, the, the main message from this talk is consider stable coins as risky assets uh, think about the fundamental risks and the structure of fund fundamental risks. I talked about custodial stable coins, non-custodial stable coins. I talked a bit about strategies. And uh, if you found this interesting, uh, please get involved. Um, we, ha we have like, like a website and a Twitter and a Discord. Please come to our Discord. Uh, it's going to be great. Thank you very much. Sure, sure. So, um, with the, okay, so um, I draw, I need to draw a little bit into the air here, and I'm sorry for that. Um, let's say you have Uniswap v3, right? And if you have a position in Uniswap v3, you have price bounds, and you provide liquidity between those two price bounds. So, what we felt is for some asset pairs, basically you know what these price bounds are probably going to be. These are not very volatile assets. Let's say something like, um, so we, we had actually some great success with ECLPs for liquid staking tokens against ETH or liquid staking tokens against each other. And it's reasonable to expect that the price is not gonna be like five, right? Um, at least when you scale to get rid of the, the yield. So what the ECLP allows us to do is um, that you have two price bounds, uh, and then what you can do is you can shape the liquidity in between. So you can say, um, where should the pool have most liquidity? Uh, and then how quickly should it fall off towards the sides? And then there are many things you can do with that. Um, the first one you can do is you can actually match historical price distributions reasonably well. Uh, it turns out that they're kind of bell-shaped, and this one is also kind of bell-shaped, so that, that works okay. Um, but you can also match assumptions that you have about the future um, reasonably well. Um, and so I think, so we, we, are, we are using this for liquid staking tokens. I think it's also very useful for stablecoin pairs where it's basically, you know, <laughs> right, where the, that, that it's probably gonna be one-to-one -one most of the time, and then you shape liquidity around that and you provide that liquidity. Sorry, hi. So um, I'm looking at the um, the uh, your demo um, reserve buckets, and w something that like um, was a bit confusing to me was um, like you. Let's look at it from a regulatory risk perspective. You try right. to diversify on that, but what about the implied risk? So take um, an example: um, the U.S. going rogue. Um, it's all isn't first of all when everything everything's correlated down to minus one when everything's going bad right but if you look at the flux die and let's say um the other stable coins they're also negatively negatively affected by adverse 
um, regulatory uh, regulatory stuff, but they're yeah. in totally different buckets. So how do you manage? How do you manage for that? Yeah, that that's a good point. Um, so so maybe what you're telling me is that my example was not super complete, and that my example is actually exposed to that one risk. Uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. So so um, I, I mean, I I, I I think I said this that you. Composition th risk is definitely something you need to think about. Um, I guess regulatory actions, when they are severe enough, um, at some point just become very hard to diversify. Um, I think it is, I mean, it is diversifiable in some assets, like liquidity, for example, which is, which really shouldn't be affected by this too much. Um, I think also having this bucket with stable coins that lie outside the U.S. is also a diversification there. Um, I I think it's I think it's like I I mean I hope everyone in this room is going to agree that a very severe regulatory action by the U.S. would be would send like very severe ripples across the ecosystem. So maybe at some point if your scenario is is very extreme, it actually becomes. Um, very hard to diversify, um, but I mean, in, in something like in something like Dai, Dai would not die when uh, when um, <laughs> you, when USDC goes down, right? It, but there there would be a haircut, so there's some protection already there. Uh, sorry, I'm, could you speak up a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe you're right. Sorry, what's the scenario? Can you can you say this again? I know what happens. Am I missing something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think I can't explore this scenario live, but I would be very happy to explore it further with you offline. It, uh, it did happen like that uh, with the um, uh, price going up and shorts uh, leaving some uh, insolvent positions. Well, not at large scale, so that was managed, but it, it did happen in the past. But I guess I, I also wanted to uh, mention one other risk, which, um, which is probably temporary, not fundamental, but uh, also relevant. Uh, maker PSM risk. Like if you observed um, uh, uh, price dynamics during USDC DPEG, uh, not just USDC went down, but also uh, also USDP, GUSD, right. and DAI. And that's uh, not a coincidence. That's because uh, Maker PSM has really uh, a lot of money in it, like, I don't know, billions, right? And uh, uh, all those coins are essentially pegged to each other via the PSM yeah. until the PSM get ar gets arbitrary rushed out. So at least for some days, all these stable coins went down together with USDC, despite having uh, absolutely no exposure to SVB. Yes, yes. 
Um, so okay. Okay, I'll 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 try to come up with a strategically clever answer. Um, <laughs> gyroscope isn't doing this. Um, so what gyroscope is not. So this like mint and redeem scheme is we're pricing the assets. Um, so if USDC is at 70 cents, we're not pegging one to one to USDC. Um, but the system would see that there's a stable coin. Um, it's under peg, it's under collateralized. It would see that uh, not under collateralized. Sorry, the, the stable coin is under peg. Um, right now, it would actually uh, just prevent people minting against that stable coin because it would basically decide that this price is not meaningful. Let's put it like this. Um, you could also switch the system and it would just allow minting and redeeming at whatever the price is, but I think that's very dangerous. Um, so the solution to this problem is um, be, be a good example to, to Maker and make them change the way the PSM works. <laughs> All right, thank you, thank you. Uh, big round of applause for Stefan. And just a quick reminder, since uh, now people are trickling in, it's standing room only here, but there is upstairs, uh, Raft Finance is on the other stage uh, conducting some, uh, some demos, some workshops. So if you are in the back and can't get a seat, then go ahead and check that out.